Uh, welcome back. Uh, glad to see that we are still getting some people to attend. So, okay. So we have to start with uh, just to remind you where we were. We were trying to implement pair, right? Which is a data structure that contains two things, and uh, we realized after the class that there is a huge problem with the code we've written here. I mean, massive. Just uh, unbelievable how it just uh, uh, snuck in. So it, it can can someone tell me there's something very wrong with this? What is it? But of course, it does compile. It compiles, yes. <coughs> Just as a hint, it has something to do with that. <laughs> so what, what, what does semi-regular mean? Yes. Um, you don't necessarily have equality. You don't necessarily have equality, <laughs> exactly. And down here. I mean, up there we said semi-regular, but then we defined equality, which you know it's clearly bogus, right? It, it compiles because the compiler is not enforcing any uh, concepts, but once it starts to, this is not going to work. Right? So, uh, what do we need to do? Make it something that, <laughs> that allows equality. So yeah, we could just strengthen the requirements and say that it has to be regular, <coughs> but then uh, many people wouldn't like that. I guess. Uh, I mean, so what our intent here was, if equality is defined on first and second, then we want pair to have equality. So if both of the parts are regular, we want the pair to be regular. If the parts are semi-regular, we are okay with the pair being semi-regular. Right? Yeah. <coughs> yes. Right. So what we are defining here, these two functions, these are not these are not members. These are friend function, right? And the reason we put them in here is it's just convenient. <coughs> you don't have to re re repeat the template line again, etc. Right? But here, since our requirements are different, what we should actually do is complete the pair here, and then define the function separately. Um, <coughs> We don't even need them to be friends. I mean, it's all public, so I don't think we need them to be friends. Um, yeah, I guess we'd have to. And then we can change our requirements. Okay, looks good. I need to define regular, absolutely. Uh, what do I need to fix about pair? Ah, oh, yes, that is true. Now that we are doing this, we get to do p1, comma p2, reference. Put it on a separate line. Uh, put what? Why? <coughs> so this, in general, is going to be a big problem once uh, concepts come into the language. Because so far, a lot of classes use this technique of defining a lot of, and I mean, here there were friend functions. We could move them out. But let's say you have a method that is only defined if the class meets certain stronger uh, requirements. So, for example, the list can have a short method too. If you don't call it, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to use it, then you For list. example, yes. What John refers to that in STL there is a <coughs> list.sort, which obviously requires that value type of list provides you with total ordering. And obviously, for the last 20 years, what we were just relying on, that when you call list, then we need this requirement. But it all, and we, we're going to see when Param is going to show us how to implement iterators, we're going to see a really egregious example of how, how complicated it all becomes. Uh, 
So when, when uh, concepts come, there will be a dramatic shift in <coughs> lots and lots of code. Even paired and current standard doesn't require a single regular. Um, it doesn't require the type to be semi regular. So it requires nothing. Um, well, it requires that they be disruptible. I see. Um, but other than that, like, it doesn't have any requirements. Also, if. A default not equal that calls the corresponding equal. Yeah, you can regular like Yes, and I believe the original STL did have something like that. What, what, what? A default not equals method that will call the equals method if it is defined for the types. Yes, what I attempted to do was <laughs> to put this thing for an arbitrary type into the global namespace. So that basically you would always get it. And of course, you know, I'm at France came and they said, well, that would restrict their freedom because they clearly have cases <coughs> where they want this to be equality and this is going to be modular multiplication. <laughs> uh, and you know, cannot argue with great people. So. Uh, they took this definition and moved it to a special namespace in case you need it. Therefore, nobody ever gets it. And the same thing, obviously, they did with greater than, less than, or equal, everything which was sort of, again, they were all defined in the global namespace so that if you define less than, you get all four. And somebody came and said, well, but, you know, in my case, uh, the, I think it might have um, famous John Scala. There was a guy once upon a time, before your guy's time, but he was probably the most influential member of the Standard Committee because he represented two countries. When I saw, you know, there was an American delegation with one vote, and there was John Max Scaler, this fellow, with two votes, because first he got somehow Australian vote, and then he wrote to New Zealand Standard <laughs> Association, say, "Well, I'm going to all these meetings. Would you let me vote for you?" So then he had two votes. So there was this guy. Uh, by the way. Who funded his standard activities? You guys don't know anything. I thought you were experts. <laughs> his mother. <laughs> <laughs> he was unemployed, and he went to all the standard committees because his mother was so kind. And said, well, poor boy, I mean, you know, he wants to, you know, participate in scientific activities. So, and fortunately, by the way, for me, he was a great admirer of STL. So he voted. I got automatically two votes on ISO. <laughs> uh, but uh, he, he, he had major problem with that because he said that he, has, he always were referring to these codes he was writing. Nobody ever saw these codes. But uh, he would always say, well, I have this code where I use this glyph for that and the other glyph for something else. And Therefore, I have to vote against that. Let's move it to a separate namespace. So we're going to see many, many examples of sort of loose ends. And they, they seem not to disappear. For example, this thing, I have been making fun of the language right now for about 30 years. And you have to, you have to agree, it's, it's rather egregious thing that you could have inconsistent equality and inequality. And language does nothing about it. And they wouldn't even put a sentence. For example, say, okay, you don't want to synthesize, but at least you have to write in this language saying that you are required to provide this semantics, however you implement it. 
but that would be too restrictive for people who want to make it modular division or whatever. Right? So it's 30 years of public fund, and they still, still have it. So we could have inconsistent equality and inequality, and it's not even frowned upon. Well, I could think of reasons to have two definitions, even if they were, or to require two definitions, <coughs> even if ideally they should be consistent. I mean, one reason is, well, maybe you don't trust your compiler enough to uh, efficiently implement both. Do you know such an example? I, I'm not saying I do, but you know, this was That's why you have to stop. Sort of the, the problem is that I do not know. I looked at a whole bunch of things, and this is always seems to be equivalent. Sort of it never, nobody ever comes up with a faster definition of inequality. Well, think I mean, about it. They differ it. by one negation. So whichever if you can implement more efficiently, instru you implement. Instruction <laughs> sets are flexible. They could test for taken and not taken. Well, for example, a compiler might reach deep enough to, uh, to use, say, vector notation for equality, but they see the knot and they can't get past that. Again, I don't know an example, so maybe there aren't any, but maybe... Okay. Observe the following. Thing. Let, us, let, us, let us see that it is fundamentally an evil argument. Okay? The moment you say that you could be semantically different, semantically different, you basically say that there will be code which nobody could understand. Do you agree with that? You either do or do not. But you could also say, well, the fact that you let equal equal be arbitrarily defined as anything you want could also have evil code because you could absolutely absolutely and we started talking and we'll be talking about what equal equal must do you are not at liberty to redefine equality you are not at liberty to redefine one for example if somebody comes to you and says that for the benefit of a9 one is going to be seven do not listen to him even his name is Jeff. One is one. It's the first non-zero non, non positive integer and must remain so. Right? That is, that there are certain things which you should view that this means equality. This means that somehow the Leibniz axiom will hold. Somehow. It's complicated to, to, to describe. But Otherwise, people cannot write code. They would know what does it mean two things are equal, right? But the nine number is going to be the nine number. Yes, and people should be put in jail for that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I understand the argument with, with regards to math. But for example, in computer science, you have things like uh, regular expressions or mm -hmm. Uh, BNF notation. Yeah. You have effectively mathematical notations where the same symbols are used with different meaning. You mean that in BNF you use uh, angle bracket for something else? And uh, I don't understand what you're talking about. Right. Like you end up using the same symbols, but they mean different things. Well, again. But e equal to and not equal to. Well, okay, if regular expression. That equal to and are not equal to are part of the symbols that mean different things. I'm just saying that in mathematical theory or programming language theory or computer science, whatever, you end up using the same symbols to mean different things in different contexts. Usually out of oversight, sometimes out of outright stupidity. That is one of the reasons, pardon me, let me, let me answer you. You ask the question, so let me answer. Sort of the, the reason we could make progress as, as a species is that we fix the meaning of words, right? So that we say that equality means certain things, for example, in society. 
And if somebody comes in our society, equality means that people with red pants are more important than people with white pants. They, they sort of fundamentally break our ability to communicate with each other. Equality means something specific. Right? We spent millennia trying to extend this notion of equality in different domains, from politics to biology to mathematics. Right? They cannot be used to, to signify arbitrary things. Otherwise, again, the, the one of the problems with sort of modern society is basically say there are no rules. Bill Gates could define anything the way he wants because he has $36 billion in the bank. But we actually have to understand there are terrible consequences if we allow Bill Gates to redefine equality as he does. Right? We have to sort of the only hope for us to, to, to do something meaningful, whether it's programmers but or in general as human beings, is to insist that words mean what they mean. Again, when the President of the United States says, I don't know what is means, we have, there was such a president. Uh, right? We have to, whatever we're Republicans, Democrats, we have to, to sort of say no. Yes. So is your suggestion that alternative notations like BNF or regular expressions? What do they have to do? I mean, BNF does not use equality. Mm. I mean, you can no, equality, but symbols. You can pick any symbol you want, but you will have an operation that is equality and one that is not equality. And the semantics Where? Has in any language. Which I'm agreeing with you. <laughs> I'm just saying to his point that you can define a grammar where the belief for equality is this and for inequality. And sadly that. enough, we have, there is this language you might have heard called C++, which does a terrible job picking this glyph for equality. For several centuries, people picked a glyph like that. Single equal sign. Sing, single equal sign. I suppose part of my, my question is, is that if, if you accept that in different contexts, like regular expressions have a plus, it's not a mathematical plus, right? The plus symbol means something. I, you know, I talked about it multiple times why in regular expression, string operation, plus is malicious. Right? Also plus must be commutative. Plus was commutative. So in, in regular expressions, it's, it's not a binary plus. It's a unary plus. It's a postfix unary plus. Okay. Is that one or more? Yeah. I do not know postfix unary plus. And this is, there is something, look. Or, or BNF. Regardless, if you want your what, language to be able to embed. I, mean, I have been writing BNF for the 30 years, 40 years. Uh, I have no idea what you're talking about. I really have no idea. I used it. I designed multiple languages. I knew Bacchus himself. I, I, what are you talking about? D does it not have symbols, like a plus symbol, for example, that does al alternation, or one, one or more? BNF, you define a bunch of rules that you build upon. So it's not like a regular expression where you're defining a single string that represents. Uh, I mean, BNF. original BNF for sure. For mm. sure, did not have any plus symbol, nor did it have equality. It did have a glyph, colon colon equal, to define uh, uh, what are they called? Matter symbols, right? But it's not, I mean, besides the point, desist. Okay, you try to understand important point I am trying to convey. I'm trying to understand the the context in which you're trying to make the point. I mean, either you think that using it's possible. I don't think I don't. If you want to write a note and send it to the class, do. I mean, I'm just uh, enough. Okay. So, uh, 
Let, let us go back to, to equality. Sort of, yes, equality has meaning, and we have to strive to figure out what this meaning is. And we will, you know, we will have to sort of come up with the definition of equality for more and more classes of objects, even within the next couple of lectures. But it has to be consistent. It has to be based on something other than, I wish to do something. Right? That, that, cannot, that cannot stand. For this, where this does mean equality, this is not BNF. This is C++, by the way. And the name of this is operator equal. There must be a connection between operator equal and operator not equal. Again, otherwise people will not be able to communicate. Sort of my, my fundamental point, the moment somebody starts breaking that, whether he's in Australia, New Zealand, or Palo Alto, he makes this totally incomprehensible stuff. He allows the following thing to happen. He writes this. This is the code which he writes. Then he goes, gets a job at Google, as he should. We don't want him at A9. And Anil, say, comes and say, well, and he rewrites the code, writing a, could you do that, Anil? Is it a plausible scenario? I'd like to do that. Yeah, he would like to do it, because he observes that it's shorter, easier to understand, things like that. And the search engine blows. Right? So you either say that people have to go and read every piece of code which they use. That Anil, before he starts doing something, has to go and read somebody's definition, which he cannot possibly do. Come on, we, we all realize that if you ask me, every time I use sign, I have to go and check where the sign actually terminates, I'll never write any code. So we are relying on the fact that, yes, people, people do things in a very coherent way, consistent way. So never mind, I mean, in, in some sense, it doesn't matter whether the standard what the standard committee says. They're they are a bunch of clueless people in some, you know as they prove time and time again. But whatever language you program in, whether you program in C++, C, or Java, you must assure that sort of related things have related semantics, even if you cannot use these glyphs. Even the language requires that you write EQ and NEQ, or whatever, whatever that might, whatever glyphs you might have to use. They have to be consistent. Right? Sort of the, the idea that there is some, some freedom is, the, this freedom is freedom to do evil, basically. You know, we, we create unreadable code. Every, every time somebody writes a function which is called sort, which randomly shuffles, he does an evil thing, okay? Even if his boss approves of it. It's not, I mean, we have to use the right names. If we invent posting lists, we should call them posting lists, not doc vectors. Yes, but C++ allows you to write a function called sort, which does a random shuffle. The question is, just because something's evil, should the programming language prevent you from doing it? No. It cannot. We know because there is this wonderful thing called Rice theorem, which tells us that no program would ever be able to determine what the semantics of a computable function is. But C++ could do two things. It could literally put the rules for overloading. Right? So it doesn't matter how you define it. It has to do the negation of equality. It doesn't matter how you write sort. 
it must sort. You cannot check. You don't have to check, but you can say that as a programmer, the you can assume program that equal, equal, not equal, equal, and not equal are, have the same semantics. Think so about it. When you're writing it. code, you have to be able to assume these things, but otherwise you cannot write code. You know, you, think about you live in this society. We, we actually trust each other. When Anil gives me a cup of coffee, I don't check if there is poison there or not. I have, I've been to his house, I drank his coffee and his whiskey, and I'm still alive, right? <laughs> when he offered me filet mignon, I didn't check whether it was filet mignon or rat meat. <laughs> huh? Huh? We, Sort of the notion of trust is the foundation of the social intercourse. Of scientific, how does scientific community function? Think about it. How do we know that Maxwell equations are correct? And most of us are not Maxwell's. Very few of us even know what they mean. They use some higher math. But we trust. Trust Maxwell, we trust the physical community. We don't think they're all crooks because they have this idea. I mean, sort of, we have, to, you know, I'm going back to something I talked about time and time again. The correctness is a result of social process, not of some mechanical process. I know that sorts sorts because I trust the guy who invented sort, implemented sort. But all this social trust could develop only when we agree on fundamental premises. That sort will be called sort, not random shuffle. And that if someone writes a sort that doesn't, you'll probably try to not work with them in the future. You know? <laughs> right, the, the, there, has to be, there has to be a fundamental sort of desire of us as a community to write components which we could use, that if I write something, Hernan could use it. Does, it doesn't mean that Hernan will have a proof checker which he will run. No, again, Alan Turing put a big stake through that. It will never exist. But it's a bogus argument. I mean, we never used proof checker for math. We use it very successfully. No, I mean, you know, most math is not mechanically checked. I don't think anybody tried to take complete Euler's works and run them through, you know, a proof checker. Yes. So, I mean, yes. Yes. We and and we must and we must and we must. Yes, we test, and wherever we can, we should prove. Not necessarily mechanically. I am not against proofs. I'm not against writing axioms. Far it be from me. These are good things. But we should understand that, well, you know, as a result, we need to create a social process which would lead to trusted software. The foundation right? of our belief that we can use this sort doesn't rest on the mechanical things, it rests on our belief that you were actually trying to sort. And, and, you know. and us trusting you and trusting that you actually tested. And trusted that maybe parts of it were even proven. Correct. Right? It's a social activity. Right? I would clearly trust something from a reputable computer scientist, especially it has been tested with 20 years of use. Right? Because you know, there is this, even great computer scientists could, could come up with the wrong algorithm. But sort of the, what, you know, I, I didn't, you know, I, I thought we settled certain things, but there is still people apparently who think that, that it's controversial. I don't think it is. I, I really think it's self-evident. But the fact is that for 30 years, in my particular experience, people stand up and say, but what if BNF? What if I don't know what? 
And I, I, you know, I'm not happy with that. Because other communities, they settle their battles. They no longer fight what's the meaning of plus or less than or equal. So we should, we should develop that too. Sorry. No, it's very important. Um, OK, let's move on to, um, we agree what the semantics should be, or at least I think you should all agree that this is reasonable to assume what the semantics should be. Now the question is, is this always what equality is like? So are there pairs of things where you would want to do something different from, from uh, member-wise equality? Or is this always how equality should be defined for any pair of things? And here I'm using pair as an English word, not, not a C++ class. Seems good. Seems good, OK. I was going to ask, so I mean, last week or the week before, um, Alex had the example of the two senior managers being equivalent. And I, I want to sort of talk about sort of equivalence versus equality. There are issues of equivalence, but let's stay with equality for now, right? So we're, we're, we're yeah. Yeah. So from the you know from the point of view of Leibniz, uh, you know, uh, if you apply any reasonable function to this object, it will have the same result. Okay. So equivalence, I think, is is it, it, equality is sort of innate, and equivalence you can define different equivalences. So I, I might have a type. And I can define for this particular use, you know, uh, suppose I want to do uh, case insensitive sort now. I can define that these two strings are, are equivalent under case sensitivity and sort them. But then, you know, that, that's, they're not equal. And then at a different time, I might want to um, not do that. So, so the equivalence is sort of a, I sort of think of as a, I don't know what the right word is, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, you can change it. But equality, you can't really change. Yeah. That, does that make sense? Okay, so going back to the yes. uh, in pairs, not in the language, but in general, uh, if the pairs of items of the same type, I can assume it equality, like uh, with uh, switching positions of items. Okay, so if you were using this to represent just an unordered two things, then you would want something else. Another very canonical example is rational numbers, right? You could represent the rational numbers as a pair of integers. They are actually defined as pairs of integers. They are defined as that. And when are they equal? Well, they have to be in their simplest form, right? Or another way to do it is if you have two rational numbers, a over b and c over d, they are equal if uh, a times d is equal to b times c. Right? So, so here we are getting into, I mean, so far, the equal to we wrote was very straightforward. It was, say that again. If B or D are 0, then they're not even rational numbers. So the question doesn't come up. <laughs> they are still pairs. So you have to say, it's a ra I mean, a rational number is a pair such that B is not 0. I mean, otherwise, it's not a rational number. We don't know what that is. So, so think about the complexity of this. Right? This is. If you take two n-bit numbers, and you multiply them, you get a two n-bit number. Right? So you're, 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 it's, no, it's no longer a simple, if my object is such and such big, I can just compare the bits, and I know what's equal. This is going to be much more complicated. And it could get arbitrarily complicated. So for example, we were talking about uh, search indexes. Right? If you wanted to say, OK, so a search index is equal to another search index if for the same query it produces the same result. That is going to be a really difficult property to check. I mean, if you tried to, to define a behavioral equality using that, it, I mean, you may have to just give up on that and say, okay, it's more useful to define just something like a, a representational equality. Is, is, it, is it the same set of bits in some sense, right? So, so for instance, uh, you might say, is it the same uh, set of terms and is it, is, is it structurally the same? And, in, and then it's good enough. Otherwise, you know, so, so member-wise, you just compare. Right? So um, another thing to think about, actually, going back to pairs, think about complex numbers. Right? A complex number could be represented as, in Cartesian format, just x, y. 
Right? And there, equality is simply uh, pairwise equality. But you could represent it in polar notation, and then equality becomes a lot more complicated. Because then the angle can, you have to you know, find the smallest angle less than 2 pi, and then compare the angles. So it's not just what kind of object it is, it's how it's represented. And uh, so equality can get complicated. You have to be careful. With, uh, right? so, so there's behavioral equality. We may not be able to get behavioral equality, in which case we would go settle for representational equality. Is it, is it represented the same way? And in many cases, that is, that is good enough. Are complex numbers semi-regular? I don't think they are. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. You cannot create a copy of a complex number. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, yeah, I, I forgot what somebody uh, Assignment, it wouldn't work? Oh, assignment. It just means it's but constructible, it. copy constructible, assignable. Regular adds equality. Okay. They are much stronger than all that. And they, they are totally at least most mathematicians write equality for complex numbers without much hesitation and define it exactly this way. You know, two numbers are equal if their real parts are equal and if their imaginary parts are equal. They do. Yeah, yeah. Yes, they were. Would you? I was just asking. Would you? So, if you were, if you were implementing uh, uh, just, uh, complex and rational numbers and pairs, would you want to? It, it seems reasonable to impl implement. Well, uh, I, I don't. I don't know whether your code that implements pairs should have anything to do with your code that implements uh, comp uh, rational numbers. Absolutely. I think the code for writing maybe pairs maybe, yeah. should be this. Yeah. But since we're talking about equality, it is worth thinking about you know, what, what are the issues that come up if you're trying to define equality. When I say you have anything to do with I mean, is there any value to shared implementation between these two? If equality is different, is there you know, a pair is so simple? It's, it's a little bit mathematicians, believe it or not, are slightly fuzzy there, slightly. Because while, of course, they mean to say that a rational number is every one number is a set of all pairs which are equal, and there are also very many. You know. One, two, two, four, three, six. Should I go? No. OK. You do. Wow. <laughs> so OK. They, but then they happily speak about numerator and denominator. And they don't really, the moment you say denominator, you obviously don't mean a set. Because then it will be a set of like, lots of numbers, and you, know, you cannot even figure out what it is. It's, it's especially interesting, a set of numerators, which would be, oh, very gigantic. Oh, both of them are very gigantic. So they, you know, they're slightly, and you have to, you have to uh, understand that mathematics is not done for computers. It's done for human beings. So you have to, you read the context, and you, you sort of say, oh, well, they, they, of course, they mean these equivalence classes. But then you say, yeah, and of course, they're talking one over seven. That is, it's, it's context dependent. Uh, Leslie Lambert, who is a famous sort of uh, computer scientist, always explains that mathematicians do not know how to do mathematics. I think he's wrong. I mean, he's a great man, but mathematicians do know how to do mathematics. They happen to be the only people who know how to do mathematics. Uh, it's like programmers in general, not in every individual instance, know how to program because <laughs> they're the only people who do program. So, yes. okay. So often we have to implement representational equality, right? So even uh, so, what 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 does there that mean? There is just one right. sentence you missed. Yes, the sentence what he meant to say. I know I could read his mind, is that sometimes it's truly hard to implement equality. For example, if we want to say that two priority queues are equal, if they would pop things in the same order, it might be hard. 
but you still want to have some kind of equality, a compromised kind of equality. Not as good as the ultimate equality, but something usable. And where do you need this usable equality? In your search? No, 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 no. Where do you need usable equality in terms of when we talk about things? You see, remember we talked about copy construction and assignment. You see, in copy construction and assignment, we don't really need ultimate equality. We could get by to state the post condition as using weaker equality, representational equality. Basically, you need to say, well, you know, when you copy two priority queues, you get priority queue which is representationally equal, not behavior. And this is a very practical point, because if you are implementing a type, you may implement a copy constructor. And then you'd say, OK, I should write a test for my copy constructor. How do you write that test? You need your equality. I mean, it may, you would either have to define it yourself uh, inside your test, or you might as well just put it on the type. So in, if it is very difficult to do behavioral equality, representational equality is still very useful uh, in, in these cases, right? So uh, let's talk about a few more things here, right? So when we were doing representational equality, what were we doing? We we're saying we have n parts, and we're just going to say each part must be equal to uh, the corresponding other part, right? And now, it's like, okay, what is a part, right? In, in this case, the object consists of these bits. This is part one, this is part two, right? The, the, the parts are all internal. Right? But sometimes the parts could be external. So for instance, if you have a, a vector, a vector will have some small amount of memory, and then there'll be a pointer to an extent, right? And then this, this whole thing is one object. This extent is a part of the object. If you're implementing equality, you have to consider, consider this as a part of, of your object, right? So, so unfortunately in, well, in programming languages, we use pointers to represent both the part of relationship and just any other relationship. And therefore, you have to be very careful. If you have multiple, if you're dealing with pointers, you have to be very clear about what are the parts of this object and what are not parts of this object. So let's say you're implementing a spreadsheet, right? You might say, I have my cell. It has uh, some value, and maybe it has another thing that, you know, how to format it. And then I have some other list of which other things need to be recomputed when I update my cell. You might say, well, this is just, you know, it, for purposes of equality, this is my object, and I want to, these are the things I own, and, you know, these don't really change. So you have to be very clear about what, what are your parts, what are not your parts. And if you're doing something like uh, what Lisp does with uh, linked lists, where nobody knows who's part of what, you just have pointers to cons cells. And then, of course, then, then there's no way to manage that memory. You need to do garbage collection. If you know what object contains what parts, you can do stack-based memory management. Object goes out of stock, scope, you free it, right? We, write, we all use maps and vectors in our code without thinking about memory management because we never have to malloc anything. We never have to free anything. We don't need any garbage collectors. But if this notion of ownership becomes fuzzy or not clearly defined, then it becomes much more difficult to manage that memory. Let's anything talk about it after lunch.